Assalamu alaikum to all our viewers across Africa as we welcome you to the beautiful studios of MTA International in London. In today's edition of Contemplation, we look at the declaration of Gambia as a Muslim state and what the declaration means for non-Muslim minorities. And with me to discuss the issue is Ustaz Abdullah Deba, who is a Gambian. Deba, assalamu alaikum. How did you receive the news, Gambia, as a Muslim state? Um, <clears throat> the day it happened, obviously, I received um, a news from a friend who sent me a link to an online newspaper where I read it myself about um, the country being declared by our president as, um, as an Islamic state. So I read it through a newspaper. That's how the news got to me. Right. So, so what does that mean, Gambia as a Muslim um, state. We know that predominantly um, Gambia is a Muslim country, but then when it goes beyond that and then there is a declaration by the president, Gambia is now a Muslim state. What are the implications? Um, for a country or for a nation or whatever it may be, a group of people to be declared as an Islamic group, nation, country, regardless of wherever they may be, comes with a lot of responsibilities. Right? It takes us back to the roots. And for that to happen, for that to be taken up, we need to look at what the Quran says as far as implementing law is concerned. Or even by not saying um, a state or, or, or a government, right? We can just say in general, an organization. Because that's what was shown by the Holy Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him. Because an organization can exist without a government. For example, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, says that when three people embark on a, on a journey, one person should be chosen as a leader, right? To take decisions and for times of prayer, and if there are any disputes that need to be settled, that person is chosen as a leader. So now there's no government involved in this as such, but then there's an organization. So the way an Islamic state, whatever is, is run, would be called an organization, mm. right? And whatever way that that organization has to be run, is called the Sharia. Mm. And the Sharia, in essence, is the teachings of the Holy Quran. Right, we, 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 we will come back um, the to um, the Sharia. But then, did you see it coming, Gambia, as a Muslim state? Um, one, in one way, I would agree. I would say, yes, I saw it coming, based on the reason why it was called an Islamic state, in the sense that because the majority of the Muslims, uh, of, the con of the population, is Muslim. Right. In that sense, if but you what say... What percentage are we looking at? We're looking at 95%, 90, 94 to 95% of the population being Muslim. In that sense, based on the reason why it was called an Islamic State, I would say, yes, I saw it coming, because it was obvious. But looking at the teachings of what an Islamic State should be like, based on the practice of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, I would say that it's far away from being an Islamic State. It's far away from being yes, an Islamic far, state. So how away. has it been like before this declaration? How has the relationship been like? Has uh, the country been administered Islamically? And what are some of the repercussions um, so far? No, the, the, the country has never been um, um, in, in, in such a situation. But even if you look at other countries that already estab have established themselves as Islamic states or as Islamic republics, for example, Pakistan, we see that um, it comes with a lot of difficulties that no country wants to face, right? Because as far as citizens of a country are concerned, one of the basic rights that any citizen can have is the right to choose legislation, right? And that cannot be based on the majority you know, of a population. Because if we say Israel, for example, is predominantly a Jewish nation. So if the Judaic laws are to be implemented and Israel, then I've read those laws. I know personally that it will be very, very difficult, almost impossible for any other person to live um, within Israel if that law is implemented. So if it's based on the majority, it will cause a lot of chaos in mm. the world. Because in one way, in one part of the um, world, Islam would be the law. And then you have Christianity, Hinduism, different parts. So this would lead to even confusion between people. Ev everyone would be right to say that, well, if all of these people say that their law comes from God Almighty. So that causes a confusion as to say God is contradicting himself. Which one do we follow, right? Do we follow India, for example, which is dominant, predominantly Hindus, 
if they introduce Hinduism, mm -hmm. it will be very, very difficult for Muslims to live in, to, to live in India or, or, or Pakistan, for example, as, as, an, as an Islamic state. So this will bring about a lot of problems mm -hmm. because even the standard, why I said I didn't expect it coming, is that the standard of morality or the, the people who calling themselves Muslims, even before their country being declared an Islamic Republic, have a lot of standard that they have to reach, right? So if, if, if it's enforced onto them or if it's taken up as a law, it will only make life difficult because there are a lot of Muslims that drink alcohol, regardless of it being um, a law of their country or not. A lot of Muslims that are involved in prostitution, that, take, that call themselves Muslims, but they're involved in these things. And we know around the right. world. So, so quickly, so let, 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 me, let me ask you, a lot has obviously changed. Uh, mm -hmm. Looking at the complexities of the economic, social, and political uh, order, you have lived them, um, perhaps the, your, uh, the whole of your life, in, mm -hmm. in, in, in the Gambia. Mm -hmm. Do you think um, the message would be received wholeheartedly by Gambians, citing um, you know, what, what, you, what you've started, um, immorality, and, 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 and what have you? What, what, what could be their reaction? Of the, Gambians. the reaction would be that from the outset it will appear as if because it's only been declared a lot of Muslims may seem to say well it's victory for us but then if it's delved into if it's looked at it very critically to say what does an Islamic State require of us or an Islamic Republic what are those things that are expected of, from every single individual that calls themselves Muslims if it's enforced because if it becomes a law it has to be practiced on a daily basis. You don't choose to become a Muslim today and choose not to become a Muslim tomorrow because it will become the laws of the land. So even now that it's open for everyone, regardless of what religion you belong to, a lot of Muslims are there that do not even know, they don't even know the, the details, or they even know the details of what Islam requires okay. of them. So they're called Muslim by faith, not, not even the five daily prayers. They do not even pray. I personally know a lot of Muslims. So by choice, they cannot even stand up to that way of life. So when it's enacted upon them, it can only lead to more and more problems. Really? Right. Um, let's look at um, infractions of the law hmm. on um, non-Muslim minorities. How is it going to relate to them? Because um, the United Nations are, has been very critical of infractions of the law, infringement of human, ri human rights violations, and so on and so forth, and Islamic State coming into being. Mm. Because we don't have 100% um, of the people are, are, as Muslims. Mm -hmm. uh, how is that um, go, uh, going to relate to them? Again, yes, we'll have to go back to the traditions of the Holy Prophet. May peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Because as members of the Ahmadiyya com Muslim community, we believe by practice and by faith that whatever has to be, that whatever, um, whichever is to be taken up as Islamic has to be related directly to what the Holy Prophet, may peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, practiced and preached. And in this sense, we all know the religious part of it, which is telling us to pray, to, to pay, um, uh, to give alms, right? To go to Mecca for pilgrimage and et cetera and et cetera. As far as the spiritual part of it is concerned. But then there's another part of it. We know that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, was also a statesman. He was a leader. Right? Not only a religious leader, but he also, he also played the role of a political leader. So as far as those practices are concerned, are they in the same line with those practices that he did as far as religion is concerned? So that definition has to be there. <coughs> right? those, because some people argue, that even Muslims argue, that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, was only a political leader because Mecca and Medina in those days didn't have any defined law. So because he took over the place, he was the leader, he had to implement something. And whatever he did was temporarily. But the Quran completely disagrees with this. It tells us that whatever the Holy Prophet did, did in fact, as a verse um, mm. of, the, of the Holy Quran, that tells us, um, I'll just read a quote. Um, in uh, chapter 59 of the Holy Quran, verse 8, God Almighty says that whatsoever the messenger gives you, take it and whatsoever he forbids you, abstain from that. And then again in chapter 4, verse 66, these two are quite related. He said, God Almighty says, but know by thy Lord, God Almighty is swearing, that they are not believers until they make thee, the Holy Prophet, a judge in all that is in dispute between them. 
and then find not in their hearts any demur concerning that which thou desirest, and submit with full submission. So he's saying that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, whatever decision he takes, if there's a dispute between people and he decides that one party is right and the other is wrong, the party that is on the wrong has to accept that decision of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And this is in fact part of faith. So we conclude from this and many other verses of the Holy Quran that those decisions, those actions that the Holy Prophet did were not based on his personal desires. They were commandments mm -hmm. by God Almighty. And again, we have to look at if those things can be taken up by people after the Holy Prophet, um, peace be upon him, right. or was it only limited to his time? Right, let's um, um, look at uh, minority groups once again, because the Holy Prophet Islam, Muhammad Islam, um, during his time also had uh, minority groups when he was a um, um, leader of Arabia then. How did he deal with them? They weren't Muslims. Mm -hmm. How did he? Uh, did, did he put um, Sharia on their necks? Mm -hmm. Did he compel them mm -hmm. to abide by the dictates of Sharia vis-a-vis -vis what is happening in the Gambia? If Gambia should eventually ratify that um, declaration mm -hmm. as a Muslim state. The example of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, like you've asked, is very clear. And it's true that uh, when he migrated from Mecca to Medina, now, regardless of what faith they belong to, Jews, Christians, and people of no faith in general, the Arabs, all agreed to take him, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as the statesman. You can call him the governor of Medina. So everyone was under him, right? Because obviously he was first in hand as far as Islamic law is concerned. So how did, we, how did he deal with the people around him? God Almighty tells him in, the Holy, in many verses of the Holy Quran, but then one common one is chapter 88, verse 22 to 23 of the Holy Quran. When God tells him, thou art but an admonisher, thou hast no authority to compel them. So he tells the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, that you have no authority whatsoever to compel people to abide by those rules and regulations. Right? So the people that are in Medina or, or, or Makkah, when he later came there, who are not Muslims, the Holy Prophet is told by God Almighty that he has no right to compel them to follow um, the, the, the Sharia in itself. And he even said, would you like your dispute, whenever and anything would happen, someone would commit a crime or something would happen, and then the matter is brought to him. Let's say the person is Jewish by faith because he was, they accepted him as their leader. He would tell them that would you like your dispute to be settled according to the Jewish law, or according to the Islamic law, or according to the arbitration. So he gave them options. It doesn't have to be in accordance with the Islamic law. So people, minorities living in the society where the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, had established Islam as a, as a religion, he and the Muslims abided by that. But then the other people also had mm. that option. And he always gave them that option. So Islam so makes a provision for the protection of minority groups yeah, yeah. in uh, you know, such um, situations. Now, let's look at the m issue of morality. You mm -hmm. spoke about how low uh, most Gambians have become when it comes to um, such issues. Uh, most of them, or let me say some of them, don't even pray the five daily prayers. Um, some of them do, do, do not understand the implications of a, a Muslim state. Mm -hmm. How is this going to affect them if eventually the ratification takes place? Okay, a very, something, it's a scenario that has been established already. We've seen problems emerge from some countries that have taken up the step. For example, a country like Pakistan. We know that, um, for example, there was riots in 1953 against the Ahmadiyya Muslim community to whether to um, embrace us as Muslims or not. And it took the court so many days and weeks just to get to the conclusion of what is the definition of a Muslim. A simple definition of a Muslim could not be decided on. The reason being that, first we talked about people of different faiths, right, being in different parts of the world. This in itself is a problem, right, because one of the basics of a citizen of a country is to take part in legislation, right. This is one problem of its own. But then, even within Islam, even if it's 100% Muslims living together, the world has turned out in such a way that Islam has been divided into many other sects. So the time of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, when Islam was in its purest form, right, there was no distinction 
between A and B. Everything was clear because everything was first hand. But now the situation is very different. You have Islam has been divided into many, many different sects and people have different interpretations of what the Sharia means. So whose idea will be taken and whose idea will not be taken? And the Muslim scholars, the mullahs, think that only they have the authority to choose as to what should be done to X and what should be done to Y. No other person in the society has any right whatsoever. So it will be a complete dictatorship by those people who think only they understand the law. And there's a very big dispute between them. Even the issue of alcohol, it's mentioned in the Holy Quran mm. that alcohol is forbidden. Right? Don't even go close to it. But then the Quran hasn't mentioned any punishment for someone who drinks alcohol. So then some Muslim scholars say that there should be a punishment. And others say, well, the Quran hasn't said anything about it. What should we do about it? So in this state, if it's established in any part of the world, regardless of what, the morality level is very low. People have not been told the reasons why they shouldn't drink alcohol. People are still involved in those things. If all of a sudden, in any part of the world, this law is enforced, what do you do to those people? Who decides? Whereas within Islam, we have so many different mm. you know, interpretations to that so-called Sharia, which seems to be one written book. Mm. But if we look into it, for people who are involved in it, we know that who do we, whose call do we listen to and whose call mm. don't we listen to? And in the end of the day, it will become politics. Maybe one scholar would be debating or, or, or campaigning about his own understanding as being the best and another person in another part of the country. Well, I don't know how old you are, but um, we know um, how President Jamet rose to power. It is um, not a secret. Um, uh, through the barrel of the gun, obviously, through a coup and the uh, machoism that he has exhibited over um, the years, the United Nations has caused to complain about some of his actions. His, um, you know, uh, infractions, many infractions of the law. And a lot of Gambians have protested vehemently about his uh, lack of respect for the constitutional order. This, uh, the president, Yaya Jame, has declared Gambia a Muslim state. And we know the strict provisions of Sharia. How is he going to um, administer Sharia e effectively? Looking at his background, because the Holy Prophet Islam, Islam was a religious leader who was sent by God. Mm. How is uh, President Jame going? I'm asking you this question because you are, you are Gambian. Mm. How is he going to ensure, the admin and also a missionary, how is he going to ensure the proper administration of Sharia? Um, regardless of who the person is, Exactly. We, when we look at the pure teachings of Islam, it tells us that justice has to be looked at as far as choosing a leader is concerned. It gives the right of the people right, to choose that person who will represent them. But then justice has to be kept in mind. Right? And it says that do not let the enmity of a people Right? In chapter 16, verse 91 of the Holy Quran, it says, Allah orders you to always practice justice. And then it says in chapter 5, verse 9, let not a people's enmity incite you to act otherwise than with justice. So when choosing the leader, in chapter 4, verse 59, it says Allah commands you to take to make over the trusts to those entitled to them. So it has called leadership here a trust that has been given to the indigenous people of a nation, of a country, or of a place. That the, the leader they choose is a trust that has been given to God Almighty. And he tells those people who choose their leader that Allah commands you to make over the trusts to those entitled to them. And that when you judge between men, now addressing that leader, when you judge between men, you judge with justice. And surely excellent is that with which Allah admonishes you. So the enmity of a people, whether they share the same views as you or they don't share the same views as you, that should not affect the way you lead those people. It has to be according to absolute justice. And when people are choosing that leader, whoever it may be, it has to be on the, on the precepts of who is rightful for that, as far as justice is concerned. Mm -hmm. But then when we talk about religious leadership in this sense, it will be almost impossible, absolutely impossible, if Khilafat is not established. Because after the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, this responsibility that he exercised. We have established through verses of the Holy Quran that the way he led that Muslim organization was a teaching of the Holy Quran. It wasn't a personal view that the Holy Prophet had. God Almighty guided him, right? And if 
God Almighty has shown in different parts of the Holy Quran about how marriage right should be carried out when you know how disputes in the society should be carried out how we should be living with one another he has shown that an organization should be run in this way right so if if that practice that the holy prophet has done to make that run if that's not taken up by us we we'll, it will look as if the teachings of islam are of, of a flaw because it's as if someone has got all the components to build a house he's got the sand he's got water cement whatever <coughs> doors and, and and windows but then if they don't have us um, an idea of what the house will look like we can only ca call that person confused mm. right so in that same way if we want an islamic state in any part of the world right if those conditions or those you know those um conditions that ha are not fulfilled then there's a lot of things that need to be studied to mm. go into the details of that so it's not any political um organization mm. we, we, we are running out of time but uh, the fear of sharia mm. many people shudder to hear sharia mm -hmm. they think um, the, the world has virtually come to an end when the the, the there is a uh, prospects of implementation of um, sharia mm -hmm. why do people fear sharia so it's the same problem of culture as we can say which is as if it has defined our religion for us we cannot blame the people who fear when the name sharia comes up that blame has to go to the practice of some Muslims, unfortunately. For example, we know the likes of Boko Haram and ISIS, who are calling themselves representatives of that Islamic State. And being claimants of that Islamic State, the actions, right, the end result of those actions is what a layman would define Sharia to be. If they're slaughtering people and committing suicide, then you cannot blame me for saying, well, if this is what an Islamic State is, if this is what Sharia is, then I'll have to, it's uh, they alienating people who don't understand religion, right? But then, again, if you want to know the true basis of what the Sharia is, we, do, we should not look at that Islamic, the so-called Islamic State of ISIS or whatever they call themselves. We should look at the Holy Quran in its best form and shape. And as members of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, we believe in that true Khilafat, which has been established by the founder of the Ahmadi Muslim community, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad of Qadian, who through practice from 1835 when he was born up to this day, we believe in successorship and in this day and age, in this very pre present moment, the present leader, supreme head of the Ahmadi Muslim community, the Khalifa of Ahmadiyya is living and residing here mm -hmm. in London by the name of Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmad, okay. the one leader of all Ahmadis, millions of Ahmadis around the world. Mm -hmm. And in, 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 according to our interpretation, this is the true shape of that Islamic organization with only one leader. May peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. He, what he established was not only based on territory. And in this day and age, when we talk about a country or a, or a government, we emphasize a lot on territory and people being within those boundaries, right? But as far as the Islamic st um, state or organization that was established by the Holy Prophet, there would be no need for any worry or panic because those people that do not belong to the faith also have the right to choose how they are um, um, taken care of. If in, in any way they go against the law um, of that organization, there should be special ways for them to choose maybe their own faith because that's what that's our, what I would say. Christians living in the Gambia today also have to have their own laws that you know, can be enacted upon them if they choose to because the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, had that provided for the Jews instead in case they wanted the Judaic law and the other people who wanted a normal you know um, um, arbiter to be to decide over them so this is what should mm. this is what is expected of the Gambia if it chooses mm. to be an mm. Islamic mm. But others think it, it could be an attempt by President um, Jameh to kill dissent so that uh, minority uh, uh, groups would have no say perhaps uh, would be compelled to pray as, as Muslims. Well, he was wise enough to say in a statement, you know, when he declared the country um, um, an Islamic Republic, that, you know, those people who do not belong to the religion of Islam will be respected and their rights will be given to them. So that credit has to be given to him for mentioning that. So again, I think that would be an assurance for them not to worry, mm. because this is something that has come from the mouth of the president himself, that right. they'll be respected and they will be um, recognized mm. as far as their faith is concerned. Right, so, so your, your final message? My final message would be that um, 
God Almighty tells all Muslims in the Holy Quran to pray for the best because some things may be good for you and you think they're bad for you. And some things may be bad for you while you think they're good for you. So whatever the situation is, we submit to God Almighty for the best to happen to mm. us and the generations to come. And, and to uh, Muslim clerics who think that uh, their day has come, this is an opportunity for them to exact revenge, to implement um, to the extreme, because most of these uh, clerics have extremist uh, ideologies, to implement to the extreme um, the tenets of Sharia. What, what do you have to tell them? What I would have to say is that if today this, has, this um, law is passed, where Muslims seem to be jubilating, they should also have in mind that tomorrow another neighboring country may be predominantly Christian. And if their actions disturb Christians in another country, if Christianity is established as a law of the land, Muslims may also be, may also be disturbed. So whatever decisions are taken, like the Holy Quran has told them, that it should be based on justice. And let not the enmity of a people, that's chapter 5, verse 9 of the Holy Quran, let not a people's enmity incite you to act otherwise. Right, so uh, what message do you have for Gambians? right now? The message would be that there's no need to fear, there's no need to um, panic, right? The, the call has been made, let us see what, you know, what is acted upon. Because this is not something that will be done over a day or two. It, it's something that will take decades. If success is to happen, for, for, for it to, to be in its best shape and form, it's a matter of decades. It's not a matter of an announcement being made today and everything changing tomorrow. That's not the fact of the matter. So no need to be too happy or no need to be too afraid or scared about any situation because it won't happen anytime soon as far as practice is concerned. So you heard it all. Um, Abdullah Debas message to the Gambia, to um, Gambians says that um, you need not worry. You need, you need not fear. We wish we had more time to continue with this edition of the program, but uh, that is all time will allow us on today's edition. So till we come your way um, next week from the studios of MT International in London, may the peace and blessings of Allah be on us all. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>